Hello my delicious co-creators, Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour. Today I'm with uh, Gay Henriks in your beautiful home here in Ojai, California. Hello Gay. Hello Lilu, good to see you again. Yes, this is our second interview in person. We've done a lot over the internet, on Skype. We talked about relationship because of course you're the relationship expert. You have done many, many interviews, dozens and dozens and dozens, hundreds. 500 interviews, no? Radio interviews, Oprah Winfrey. Mm. And... Uh, I really, uh, it's interesting to see you again this time. Last time we spoke of the big leap. And now last time you were speaking of this book that is now out. How cool is that? Well done. Congratulations. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a source of great joy for me because since I was 12 years old, I've wanted to write a mystery novel. I fell in love with uh, Sherlock Holmes when I was 12 years old. And I used to read all the books by Sherlock Holmes. And so 50 years later now, I have my first mystery novel out. And my own Sherlock Holmes is a Tibetan Buddhist private detective in Los Angeles. And he goes around and he solves mysteries. Some of them have environmental issues that he's working with, and some of them are straightforward crimes. But he always brings a kind of a, a Buddhist perspective to it. And I'm proud to say that Hay House is going to publish the entire series. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, number two book in the series comes out in 2013, early in 2013. And I'm now working on number four in the series, and we're working on a movie uh, about mm -hmm. the series. And so people have kind of fallen in love with my hero, Tenzing Norbu. Uh, that's why the book is called The First Rule of Ten. His nickname is Ten. Mm -hmm. And so he goes by the nickname of Ten. Uh, but his real name is Tenzing Norbu. So, um, and uh, it's kind of based on some people I met in Tibet many years ago when I had the opportunity to ride a mountain bike, my bicycle across parts of Tibet and uh, 25 years ago. So I got to meet a lot of Tibetan monks and monasteries and that kind of thing. So uh, Tibet has always had a special place in my heart. And so I made my hero a Tibetan Buddhist private detective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what are, I guess there are some lessons, and he, he discovers some things about life, about spirituality. Is that your desire? Actually, you wrote this book to, to, to reach more people on these topics? Y yes. Uh, there's a lot of people that read mysteries that might not read a book about spirituality or relationship or something like that. And so I'm very interested in helping those folks learn something about relationship, too. So, for example, the first rule of 10 is don't ignore intuitive tickles, lest they reappear as sledgehammers. Have you ever had that experience where you didn't pay attention to something and then it came wonk? You know, and it happens a lot of times in relationships, too, where, you know, we, Katie and I have worked with about uh, 40, 400 couples, I think, and um, either in here or in our small seminars. And I uh, have found that a lot of relationship problems can be prevented if you pay attention to things that are right in front of your face, but you tend to overlook and then they kind of come back to haunt you. You know, like I can't count the number of people that have sat in this very office here and said something like, you know, I've said to you for 25 years that I was going to leave you unless you got in touch with your feelings. So now I'm leaving because you never did get in touch with your feelings. And so a lot of times life keeps presenting us the same lesson over and over again, but because of stubborn pride or whatever, or just clinging to the need to be right, a lot of times people don't get the lesson that's coming in mm -hmm. until it comes in in the form of a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we can be confused if it's really a, a lesson, if it's coming from the other person or if it's coming from ourselves. Huh? That is really a key issue because a lot of people go... Uh, use up a lot of time in relationships going, is that your problem or is that my problem? Is that your problem? But the only way out of things like that is just for both people to say, okay, I'm going to claim it as my problem. I'm going to quit trying to pretend it's yours. And if you can do the same thing, then maybe we can make some magic here. Mm, beautiful. So what are some of these? So I guess he has a, he meets somebody too in the, in the book or? Well, it's a love story. It's partly a love story, and it's partly about him coming to terms with some things in himself. Um, in fact, the first two books have a lot to do with, he grew up in a monastery in India where his father was one of the abbots, one of the chief monks of the of the monastery, and his mother was a devotee who had come there to the monastery to study, but ended up, they had this relationship with his father. And so, he ended up with kind of a crazy childhood where he'd spend half the year in the monastery and then half the year with his mother, even in France, usually. And so um, 
she she had a connection to the French countryside, and so uh, he would go back and forth between the French countryside and Dharamsala, India, and so he had kind of a a split childhood. And but what that taught him was how to get along in new cultures. But one thing it as a child of two different cultures, in relationships, it causes him problems because he's not sure who he is or you know how to be in the relationship because he had to be one way with his father and one way with his mother. And many of us who are you know children of divorce or one parent families, as I was, uh, you know, can really relate to that particular kind of problem. Yeah, because there is, it's like, and, and for in many areas of our life, it's like that, isn't it? We have one foot there, one foot here, but not we're not even fully ourselves. Does he has this challenge also of, of being split in those two worlds, but not really embodying who he, we can be and accepting who he is? That's exactly it. And here's the interesting thing about this character. He came to this country as a teenager and um, ended up working for the police department one summer as a summer intern and really fell in love with it. And he joined the police department. And so he became a patrolman and then a detective for Los Angeles Police Department, LAPD. And then he went off into his own private detective career. So he's had the experience of being in a monastery and then being a policeman and now being a private detective. And so he's had all of these unusual life experiences. And now he goes about solving crimes in a whole new way that involves his spiritual life as well as his active detective I say he's equally comfortable with a mantra or a pistol in his hand. Mm. And because he meditates every day, as I do, and he also is a good shot, which I'm not. <laughs> but uh, Following his intuition, I guess. Following his intuition and playing hunches. He also has a very deep connection with two friends that he grew up with in the monastery. So he talks to them on Skype, and he has a connection with them both intuitively and in the real world. Mm. I know that you really want to bring out this message out to the world and it's fantastic how our genius side and we spoke about it on different in, in different interviews how it can really bring out the best in us and really bring it at the perfect time in a particular time on earth like it's divine timing do you feel that about this book It's been that way the whole time as a matter of fact I think this book kind of came out of meditation uh, because one night I woke up in the middle of the night And it was about 3 a.m. And I didn't feel like going back to sleep. And so I slipped into kind of a meditative space for a while. And out of that, I saw this character come to life. This monk who was a Tibetan Buddhist private detective. And I saw the house he lives in in Los Angeles up in Topanga Canyon. And so he just formed himself in my mind out of this meditative space. And then I said, oh, that's interesting because I like mysteries. I love to read mysteries. So I said, what kind of a mystery could I write that I would love to read? What would he do? And so I just put him in the middle of this mystery and have him start solving this crime. And one thing led to another. And now I'm on my fourth book about the guy. You know, it's, it's really, he's such a fascinating character. I can hardly wait to get up every morning to start work on him. Is that the same process in writing a nonfiction book? Do you do you hear the words? Is it the same creative process, or does he actually now it's a character? Does he speak to you, and you have a relationship, or how is that different? Yeah, I do have a relationship with him. I'm always asking him, "Well, what would you like to do next?" <laughs> <laughs> and he's very good about telling me too. It's different than writing a nonfiction book because when I write a nonfiction book. I might think about it for a year before I write a word of it. I might be kind of organizing it in my mind and kind of figuring out what chapters are. And I do a lot of that, and I don't even take notes a lot of times. I just organize it in my mind. And then I start taking some notes after I've got it pretty well organized. But I might even think about it for a, longer than a year before I write a word. Whereas with the mystery, I don't know what's going to happen every day when I wake up and go to work on it. You know, like exciting. Oh, it's very exciting. This morning I woke up at just a little before five and I can hardly wait to get in here and start work on the novel because I wanted to find out what was going to happen next because I'd left him yesterday in this situation, you know, that he, it's a tremendously emotional pressure situation. And I had to find out what was going to happen. Mm. And so it gets me out of bed with a 
yeah every day you know so i like things in life that get me out of bed with a yeah you know kind of yeah. attitude so and, and without uh, taking time on your on your sleep for example when we have a worry it, it kind of you know it can come back during the the sleeping time here it's something exciting so you want to live it actually you don't you don't think of it at night time or you do um Sometimes I do. If I wake up in the middle of the night, I might do a little work on the novel, you know, just up in my head. Actually, in the beginning, when, when I first wrote this book, the very first one in the series, um, I probably wrote this much of the book in my head before I actually started writing it down. I would work on it each night, but then I got tired of reassembling all of the yeah. pieces in my head. It got to be too much, you know, once I got about 20 pages <laughs> written. And so I, one night I said, okay, I got to write this down. And so I started writing it down. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. So I know you have um, big ideas on, uh, um, I, you know, we spoke of intention and the big leap and wondering and you love, I, I always remember what you taught me when we did this coaching, you know, the, I wonder how delicious this adventure is going to be. Mm, I wonder how many books I'm going to sell. And I love this because you have this. I just saw this in your office. I have to show you the one million mark. So I said, oh, you, 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 have you sold already one million? No, Lilu. <laughs> I said, no, this is an affirmation. And I had the, uh, my wife actually had this printed for me before this book even came out. Mm. And so we already had the affirmation of it selling a million. And it's on its way, but it's not quite there yet. But um, I'm a patient man. That's why I keep writing more and more. I've written four of them now. Yeah. And, and it's wonderful to see that as, as yourself a teacher for many, many years, you're, you're really applying it and you're using it because we hear of those vision boards and of feeling it. Do you actually get also in the feeling place of it? And How, what is your way of manifesting all those great things that you manifested in your life that a lot of people would love to manifest it, it too? In well, different ways, of course. But. Yeah, I think in this book and in all my other books, it's really about two things. It's about what is within us, what is deeply within us that needs to be expressed, and then how can I express that in the way that touches the most people? So for every human being, think of it like you're breathing. Your in-breath is, how much can I experience? How big a life can I live? And then your out-breath is, how much contribution can I make? How much, how much creativity can I release into the world? And so I like to think of each breath we take as a breath of deepening our experience and deepening our expression, deepening our creative expression. And, you know, if you go back to the very beginning, like there was this wonderful verse in the original Bible, but it got edited out later on of the official Bible. But the, the verse that touched me was from the Gospel of Thomas, which really, which got taken out of the Bible later on. Uh, but it was in there in the beginning. And uh, in that, Jesus is reported to have said, If you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. But if you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. And, I mean, isn't that really true? You know, that if you really allow yourself to express your creativity in the world, you get to have a great life. And if you don't, you suffer in some way. You know, so that I think in my travels around the planet 33 times around the world so far anyway i think the great pain here is not hunger or poverty it's the lack of fulfillment the lack of potential being expressed by human beings you know that it saddens me that we have tremendous potential but end up expressing so little of it and so i think it's incumbent upon every human being to make a deep dedication whether you're 67 years old like i am or 17 year old like i had some 17 year olds in here interviewing me the other day for some thing they were doing and uh, but whether you're 17 or 67 the problem is always going to be the same is what is within me what is within me what is the creative depth within me and how can i bring it forth into the world in relationship it's exactly the same you know every day of my life i live in the question how can i be better able to listen and love Katie? You know, how can I be better able to express my love for her? And so that's the question that is behind 
in relationships and behind us in relationship. Out in the business world, it's exactly the same thing. Is What is the genius that is within me and how can I bring it forth in a way that serves people, makes money, makes for a happy business culture? All of those things that are in business are exactly the same as they are in relationship work in the home because it's really all about who am I and what do I have to bring forth into the world. So what's preventing us from expressing that? What have you found out about the challenges? They're all rooted in fear and old paradigms based on past conditioning. You know, that maybe there's a life where somebody thinks you are unlovable and you take that imprint on and you say, oh, well, they're big and they have money and they have the food, so maybe they're right. Maybe I am unlovable. Maybe there's something wrong with me. You know, and so you take on those costs in relationship because if I go to have a relationship with my partner and I'm thinking of myself as damaged or flawed, I'm going to project that into the relationship, of course. And so we've all done this a million times probably in relationships point, you have to dedicate yourself to several key things in your relationship. And honest, under stress, telling the truth under stress. If somebody says, what are you feeling right now? You're able to say, oh, I feel scared, or I feel sad, or I feel hurt, or I feel angry. But being able to be honest about your emotions is probably the number one thing that makes relationships work. And not just being honest when you're angry, but being honest about feelings too. That's the real problem, is that underneath every angry person in a relationship is also a person that's feeling some sadness and some fear too, but a lot of people don't talk about it on that level. Usually men? Uh, with me and I remember him saying afterwards hey don't cry when you get hurt this is that's not going to work well in this neighborhood <laughs> you know, you're going to get the crap beaten out of you if you show that kind of weakness you know so you got to learn to tough it out and because I, I got hit by this baseball I was kind of sobbing you know and he was sort of saying knock that crap off and so that was a pretty blatant example of it. But in one way or the other, I think, particularly in, in the culture I grew up in back in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of emphasis on not showing your feelings, maintaining a poker face, keeping everything sealed out. But we've fortunately come a long way about that. I remember one of my favorite quotes was from General Norman Schwarzkopf. And he says, any man who can't cry scares me. Isn't that an amazing thing that here's this big general, you know, you'd think he'd be Mr. Tough Guy, but he's saying any man who can't cry scares me because he's recognizing that underneath anybody, even a soldier, is a person who has feelings and needs and intentions and wishes and dreams for their life. And so what I'm about is finding out how to help the maximum number of people discover the incredible richness of their ability to manifest what they want in life. Human beings have this incredible power to make our dreams come into reality. And almost nobody knows about that power, you know? And so I think it's, if you've discovered that in life, you almost have a sacred duty to communicate that to the world because we need a lot more people in the world who are bringing their dreams and visions into reality and taking responsibility for bringing their dreams and visions into reality. This is a time of, of incredible change where the old model isn't working anymore. You know, it used to be you traded your life to a corporation and then the corporation took care of you and cradled the grave and all of that, but it's not working that way anymore. The whole world has changed and it's become more of an ad hocracy than a democracy everywhere, you know, that you have things coming together for short periods of time and doing projects together, but you don't have as much of the old caretaking type of corporation as we used to have in the world. Many people are 
individual entrepreneurs now. And in fact, we at our institute teach a whole course on conscious entrepreneuring because we find that, you know, there's a lot of people that have a great idea, but they don't know the basic steps of how to bring that idea into the world as a conscious entrepreneur and keep their sanity at the same time. And because uh, I worked um, worked with many people who have gone into business for themselves and then flamed out spectacularly because they had a great idea, but they just didn't have the skills to do it. So we have this kind of eight-week crash course in how to uh, get your feet on the ground as an entrepreneur. And it feels like, uh, because of course, when you're an entrepreneur out in business, there's also relationships and there's uh, problems or things to deal with. Then we, we, we make ourselves wrong or we haven't, we, we learn to protect ourselves too, but there's a different way of, of honoring who we are and of n not hurting ourselves to move forward, to move forward to our dreams. We don't have to do it the old way, you know, which my God, but they're going to manipulate me or they were going to, you know, they're, they're in there for themselves. Things like, do you also teach that this new way of being in those, all those relationships so we can be fully ourselves without having those dreams and those old way of being there in the way? Well, that's exactly one of the key features of the program, because unless you learn those things, it doesn't matter how many business skills you have, unless you learn how to stay centered and also function at peak level over a long period of time, what happens is you get the kind of approach to your business life rather than a slow upward trend. Um, so I think that if you're going to learn a thing about business, spend an hour or two learning the bi the skills of relationship that are required in business. Yes, for sure. We teach those in the Conscious Entrepreneur Program, but anybody can learn them. You don't have to take a program. Just go out and ask somebody, ask an experienced business person, what are the key relationship skills that you think make business happen? Because you'll find the better business people really have learned a lot of things the hard way that they can tell you just like that. And so we interviewed 800 business executives find out what are the business skills that really make a difference out there and uh, boiled them down to several key things. So, But, you know, the business skills have some technicalities to them, but in a way they're very similar to what you'd use to have a happy relationship at home. You'd listen. You'd listen in a way that really had the person open up. You'd learn how to speak in a way that was absolutely honest and got the job done. You'd learn how to solve problems quickly so that they didn't take 10 weeks to solve something that takes 10 minutes. Literally, by the way, in working with 800 different business executives and over 100 corporations in the time I did a lot of business consulting, I never found a business relationship problem that couldn't be fixed in 10 minutes. But it was getting the two people or the three people willing to have that 10 minutes that was the challenge. But once it actually, once we got them in the room or once we got them on Skype or got them on the phone, it was a 10 minute problem. But sometimes they'd literally spent 10 months of wasted time grinding around and around and around in a circle and not being able to solve the problem. So anyway, that, yeah. it's a big issue. Trust, trusting is, is it, is it, I, it's well, essential? Trust is key. I look at trust a different way, though. I say you don't start out with trust, but you have to build trust. That sometimes, rarely, you'll find a person where you just automatically trust them. But you really build trust by showing up reliably and doing the job over and over and over again on time, on budget, you know, you build up trust that way. You know, if somebody comes to me, like I had a general contractor building my mountain house one time, and he came to me one month and he said, oh, I'm going to run certain amount over budget, which happened to be like a third. You know, he announced this to me. And uh, I was irritated about this, you know, because, and, he, and I had up until that minute trusted him. You know, but suddenly everything changed because he had failed to deliver. We eventually got it worked out okay, but it was, you know, it's the kind of thing where a lot of people don't realize it's the act of making and keeping clean, clear agreements over time that actually builds trust. Because if your dad 
says he's going to pick you up at four o'clock from soccer practice every Tuesday afternoon, and he only makes it by four o'clock on two times a month, well, you don't need to know anything more about that because it's the systematic over time making and keeping of clean, clear agreements that adds up to trust. Trust is also involved heavily in whether you can trust a person to be accountable or not. You know, that's um, in politics. You see people trying to avoid accountability a lot of times. They blame it on the Republicans or they blame it on the Democrats or they blame it on something else. And of course, one side blames the other. But what we would really love to see, at least I as a civic citizen, I'd love to see some politicians start taking responsibility for change. Like, you know, we did a lot to help create that recession. Now let's see what we can do to get out of it. Not, hey, the other guys, that's all their recession, you know, and because it's like a junior high school playground, people blaming each other and that kind of thing. We kind of expect our politicians to be grown-ups, And so um, um, I'd like to see them be at least as responsible as a typical high school student. Mm, does 10 also has, uh, has trust issues? Uh, 10 has tr trust issues. Yes, because also his um, relationship skills were kind of interfered with at an early age because um, his father was a very stern guy and his mother was a bit of a drama queen and so uh, he has all sorts of stuff there. So he's, he's a little bit clumsy in relationships. So he's learning. Uh, in the book I'm working on now, he's getting a lot better. But he's only in his 30s, you know. And in developmental psychology, we have a saying. We say, in your 20s, you experiment. In your 30s, you find your life. In your 40s, you build your life. And in your 50s, you enjoy your life. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, hopefully you're going to enjoy your life all along. But in general, people do a lot of experimentation in their 20s. And then along there, the light goes on. And they say, oh, there's the difference in this particular area. That's something that often happens in your 30s, you know, you kind of click in. I know it did for me. And then in your 40s, you kind of figure out the the rules of the game and how to make that happen. And for me, that was, you know, being on Oprah and putting a million frequent flyer miles on my <laughs> United card and all of those kinds of things from about 1985 to 2003 or four, something like that. And then I Fortunately, then they invented the internet and Skype video and things like that. So I can sit in my office and counsel a CEO like I did the other day in uh, Copenhagen. Um, and um, she's sitting there in the evening. I'm sitting there in the morning and um, I'm doing my coaching session. And uh, she's in her home office. I'm in my home office. So it's a, a whole different world. Whereas I can remember literally flying all the way to Amsterdam from LA on a number of occasions because I did some consulting with KLM Airlines. But I remember one time flying all the way to Amsterdam for a three-hour meeting and then getting on the plane and flying all the way back. And uh, so 11 hours in the air each way to attend a three-hour meeting. And now it's a different world, you know, and I got I love this new technological world a lot better. And people all over the world watching this and I can uh, do it without having to burn any gas in my car. Mm, I love it because tomorrow I'm taking exactly that same flight LA to Amsterdam, KLM. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting that, uh, but I love the meeting in person too. And I feel with the internet, it's also very important to keep in mind the gathering, getting all together is so precious, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of like uh, I was just doing a big event in uh, Los Angeles with Bob Proctor and Mary Morrissey and Peg McCall. We do a thing a few times a year called Making a Million Look Small and, and a thing called Supermind, which is a kind of a mastermind group of people who are really taking their lives into a whole other dimension. Anyway, I mentioned that because we were meeting with uh, three or four hundred people this year in Los Angeles. And I was realizing I really love to do things like that because there's nothing like getting several hundred people together who share the same intention. You know, and we were joking about it. We were saying, this is like the Woodstock of manifestation. You know, we're, we're uh, because Bob Proctor and Mary and Peg and I have all taught manifestation skills for many years, but we've never all four of us brought our stuff together before. And so we were joking that it was the Woodstock of manifestation. But I had so much fun doing it because there's, 
you know, the energy in a room like that is so fantastic. I just, I love it. Well, thank you for your energy. Thank you for the education, all those beautiful things that you're bringing out into the world and still are magnificently co-creating for all of us out there and for yourself. Thank you very much, Gay. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Great being with you and uh, come again sometime. Thank you. Much, much love, my delicious co-creators from beautiful California. Thank you for sharing those videos. Thank you for supporting the Juicy Tour through your donations. I send you much, much love. Blessings. Bye-bye. <laughs>